All right, you gloriously miserable accursed. Let's get this pod underway. I'm David Hurley with Jordan Leitnitz and her janky socially democratic internet, Scott Reed and his sea monkey dungeon, and Corey tonight from the 31st floor of Worldwide Perfect Beard Headquarters. Before, <laughs> before we get to the show this week, a shout out, Scott, pay attention because the others are too young. A shout out to Guy Caballero, the great Joe Flaherty from SCTV, who passed away yesterday after a battle with illness. For those of us with a certain age, nothing was funnier than SCTV, Canada's great comedy product, funnier than Saturday Night Live, anytime it was up against it, and Joe Flaherty was a huge part of it. Sammy Maudlin, Floyd Robertson, and uh, my personal favorite, uh, Count Floyd. So, any so many incredible characters and performances. Signing off to Joe Flaherty. All right. We are, here's the show this week. Here's what we're talking about. I didn't mean that to be so somber. I thought somebody would have a Joe Flaherty <laughs> joke. <laughs> Sammy Maudlin. Is so good. All right. We're T-minus two weeks to the budget, and the Liberals are on the offensive. We'll talk about that. Our curse clipping is from Douglas Todd, writing in the Vancouver Sun, about Pierre Pauly of building all kinds of support in British Columbia. And then we'll do an early look in on the provincial races in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and BC in advance of their elections this fall. Finally, Gordon arrives with the call for our hey yous. All right, so let's get to it. You group, you don't seem very chatty this morning. Nobody want to talk about Joe Flaherty, so I'm not going to ask you about your fucking Easter weekends. <laughs> right? Lots of ham. How was yours? How was yours? Um, I was great. I was at the cottage and... Um, as always, we had our annual Easter tradition with the Manny family where they come over with scalloped potatoes and coleslaw and a bunch of shit, and I've cooked a big-ass ham, and we eat, and then we sit down and watch Jesus this. Christ Superstar. This is I was our there tradition. one year for this. Every year we watch Jesus Christ Superstar. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. I mean, I hope it's a sing-along. Oh, yeah. Well, uh... It's coming back to Toronto. I think it's uh, they've got a production that's about to start. I'm telling you, it's good. Quality Tim Rice theater. wrote his ass ah. off on that show. It's yeah. great. Not as kid no argument there. I'm more right. of a Godspell guy myself. That is know? lame. That is I like lame. hippie Jesus. <laughs> Take your day by day and fuck off. <laughs> <Still checks out. laughs> All right, let's talk politics. There is new behavior from the liberals. It's unmistakable. They, first of all, they appear in a concentrated offensive from the prime minister on down to have dug in on the carbon tax in the last week in a way that makes it impossible that this tax is going anywhere as long as Mr. Trudeau is the prime minister. That's clear. Um, if there was ever going to be a time to shimmy, this was the time. They did not shimmy. They dug in on their arguments. So they will stand and fight on the carbon tax. In addition, they have a campaign-style rollout for Christia Freeland's upcoming budget. A steady stream of announcements. Help for renters last week. School food program yesterday. Today is housing, apparently. There is, in some respects, less than meets the eye to some of these things. The rental stuff was pretty thin. The school food program is only $200 million a year, so it's going to be, have to be very targeted in who it helps. Nonetheless, it all adds up to what looks like a plan for the short term and maybe a strategy for the medium term. In the long term, we're all dead. Scott, what are you seeing here? Exactly that. I see an effort to, I think it's an effort fundamentally to try to control the news hole at least. I think, you know, they, they recognize they're not stupid they recognize that april 1st is coming they know 10 days prior to april 1st they started getting slapped across the face with uh, carbon tax increase and so they spent five days giving six answers and then they decided you know what we're gonna hunker down on this thing this is a it is what it is we're gonna stand by this issue and we've offered lots of free advice and they have sent that straight uh down the well so that's fine so that's one thing they've decided and i think partly this uh budget rollout is motivated by a desire to take better control of the budget narrative to turn it into budget days instead of budget day, which is something they haven't really done as a government since 2015. But I think it's also partly motivated by April 1st. I think they they recognize that the best 
defense on the carbon tax is still losing ground for them. They recognize that from a public opinion standpoint. So can we steal some of the news hole before, during, after uh, about these things? And, you know, I think from my perspective, big shout out to our pal, Andrew Bevan, who's gone into Christian Freeland's office and I think is probably the architect of this. And, you know, they're, they're pounding away and making efforts. I don't know. Two thoughts. One, I do see evidence that it's working at when measured by, is it affecting the balance of media coverage? Yes, it's affecting the news hole. Does that affect, and this is such a fundamental question for people in our craft these days, does that affect anything? Like, does that balance of, of news, does it affect voter outcomes? Can, given where they're at in public opinion polls, can a less unbalanced measure of media get them rallying in some ways. I, I don't know, but can I interrupt, it doesn't can I interrupt feel you? like it. Yeah. There's a great podcast episode uh, on the Axe Files. Friend of the pod, David Axelrod, yeah. recently did a pod with Carl Rove and David Pluff. Now, they are the two geniuses of modern American politics, and they were super interesting. You have to be really interested in the granular nature of campaigns for this pod to appeal to you. But if you are, listen to it. And Jermaine, to your point, David Pluff essentially says that if your ideas, if your message is not living organically on social, it does not exist. And I think that's, I think that's a challenge, uh, obviously, for them here. So I think that they are, in the sense that they've been barred with an unpleasant and unremitting news hole for a, a long time. They're affecting that. But whether that, in fact, alters their political circumstance, voting intention, all of that, that remains to be seen. And let's be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm shaving it a bit. It's probably not very hopeful. Um, the, the, the only other thing I would say is um, that I've been in just as interested, and Corey and I disagreed about this today. I've been just as interested in who they're, uh, at least so far, their planks that they're announcing seem to be directed at. They're almost all directed toward a youth demographic. They're, by the way, they're mechanically briefing media on what they're doing, uh, which I like all that, like saying, hey, this is what we're doing, so please take note, creating a rhythm of coverage as a consequence. Uh, they're briefing spinners and folks out there, stakeholders, all that kind of stuff. And what they're briefing them and saying is we're taught, we're focusing on MZs. We're focusing on these um, millennial Zs and we're going after these folks because we believe that it has a positive effect on them. But we also believe that there is a significant Venn diagramming of their mums and grandmums and that it it captures them because their anxieties does do i have a place to live can i ever afford to buy a home those things are the anxieties of the moms and grandmoms men of course don't give a fuck about anything they don't mom men men don't care about their own children right so but um and I, i'm i guess we'll see i i don't know but you're the public opinion researcher david i've never seen evidence that that generational leak argument i mean it makes intuitive sense i've never seen evidence of it in action. I've actually never seen that thesis proven. So we'll see, but that appears to be what they're doing. And it feels to me like it's a little bit more defensive. It feels to me like they're trying to hold the line on um, on the NDP as opposed to going and stealing back votes from the conservatives. Well, the alternative way to get votes for female, el older female votes from the conservatives is just to run a goddamn ad that tells people that Paul Yev's going to take your pensions away. He's going to raise the age of age of eligibility to 67 or higher, and he's going to work with Daniel Smith to kill the CPP. That's what you say to get older women back, right? Jesus would Christ. Have to everybody who together, wants to work an extra two... dollars and get an ad, though. Everybody who wants to work two more years before retirement, raise your fucking hand. I promised you a different, pithy, four-word metaphor this week, Hurley Burleyites, and here it is. Skin in the game. Heck, all of us have probably used that phrase or felt the responsibility embedded within it. It's when you have an investment or a personal stake in a thing, leading to an outsized interest in its success. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, has always believed it's been the key to providing Canadians with the highest quality in our internet networks. They've lived that belief, making generational investments to connect us for decades. In February, TELUS made a pr compelling presentation at CRTC hearings looking into options for mandating wholesale wireline fiber to the premises. The question? 
how to do it in a way that best promotes competition, giving us choice and affordability. Two models are under consideration. One, aggregated access, which allows wholesale resellers to simply lease space on an existing fiber network, ride those lines without investing in any network components or connection points to a town or region. And two, disaggregated access, which requires resellers to invest in and maintain a portion of the network, to have a little skin in the game by building new and more connection points to the communities they serve. The result is a tangible commitment to their customers through investment in new facilities and improved flexibility, reliability, and resiliency in the network by building those connection points, which reduces single points of failure. Oh, and it's also consistent with the CRTC's own recent MVNO framework that requires upfront investment to tie mobile network resellers to a community and its customers. Skin in the game. Proven time and time again to do wonders for commitment, responsibility, and successful outcomes, Hurley Burleyites. In this case, driving the most sustainable form of competition while keeping our network quality at a world's leading level. Anyway, Corey, uh, they succeeded, I think, if, they, if their objective was to win the day, say yesterday, with the food program, they didn't. Because the carbon tax still is a huge daily sucking up oxygen story. They muddied the story yesterday. Like, they got into it. Like, so there was the carbon tax story and there was their story uh, about school food. But boy, um, it's a tough environment for them to get a message out. Yeah, especially if the test is what you just said from um, about, you know, having a message live organically on social media, like the 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 carbon tax has spawned a million memes like it, uh, you know maybe bad for the real economy but it's in- incredibly good for the meme economy uh <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there on that and a lot of people talking about it just i'm sure we've all encountered it in our daily life in anecdotal ways but uh you know but if you think of you know what 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 was animating political conversations insofar as there were any happening over the over the easter weekend I'm going to suggest that uh, the school lunch program uh, was one uh, percent of the conversation, if that, as opposed to the other ninety-nine, which was carbon tax. So, uh, you know, I, I think you know it's it's a valiant but a futile effort uh, to uh, to paper over that with uh, with a little bit of jazz hands and uh, press conferences. I do sense, though, and, and I don't know, uh, maybe, Jordan, you can jump in here. I do sense, though, and, and I, I, th- I just want to lay this out as a positive, but if you don't think it is, then rebut it, that at least I am seeing something coordinated that appears to have had some thought behind it as a plan, a coordinated offensive. It may or may not work, but they are trying something, right? Sure, yes. And I struggle because I, too, wish to give cookies for what is really a baseline modicum of of political communications acumen here. But I think this also speaks to a little bit how how the standards have slipped in terms of what this PMO is viewed as capable of delivering in terms of communications, cohesion, and planning. Like, this is, to to me, this is like a pretty basic pre-rollout type thing. And I think probably five years ago, it might have been quite effective in terms of actually trickling down and reaching voters without uh, without paid behind it, but we're not living in that time anymore. And so I think that to Scott's point, it's correct that they did, they carved out some space and earned media to counter program to the carbon tax stuff around April 1st. You can definitely see the necessity of doing that coming up to a long weekend. Like we know everyone went home and had these conversations. So you have to find a way to be in there somehow. So yeah, I think that they did grow some space in the media for that, but I really struggle to see how this actually connects with voters. And I guess I have two, I've got two real concerns with, with what they're doing. And, you know, to be very clear, like I, you know, I think we've all been in a version of that meeting, right? Like I need, you know, give me, give me five announcements that, you know, don't, don't cost a lot of money and we can, we can bam, 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 roll them all out. Right. But there's a couple of things I think that, Uh, pose a challenge for the government with that is the first is it's a bit of a fire hose, right? So you've got, you know, they're out in housing, they're out on school meals, you know, they're doing childcare. So they're a bit all over the place in terms, you know, and obviously they want the connective tissue there to be affordability, but it's also, 
it's it's a it's you're not digging into one thing long enough to have it uh, really stick as a firm narrative. And the second thing is, and this is maybe uh, a, like a particularly liberal sin, but this is really, it's all small fucking ball, right? Like this is, uh, you know, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on the renters announcement because I think it's maybe the easiest one to, to do this with, but look, uh, okay. Your rent should count towards building your credit score. Okay, sure. I'm I am forced to consider whether these folks have actually met a renter today who is struggling. Like their issue is not that they can't build up a sufficient credit score to afford a mortgage. It's that they can't scrape together a down payment because their wages haven't grown enough. It's that they can't get approved for a mortgage. It's that they can't find a house for a mortgage that they can get approved for. And so, you know, to, to Corey's point on the memes, like to me, this it really like it brings, you know, the meme of like the guy drowning and then someone goes in with a high five. It was like a little bit like that. And so sometimes <laughs> with, with these announcements, like when you go small, you actually risk underscoring that you don't get the problem. And so I, I think that on the housing one in particular, to me, it was it was a little bit weird because you have Fraser out there who's been doing a lot of the legwork over the last six months, talking in very large terms around supply issues, around generational change, around, you know, like getting elbows up and shoving things around in a big way. And then you and then you're coming out with like these like teeny weeny little shitty like adjustments on the fringes of what people actually view as the problem. And so I didn't love that. Um, and and a lot of it to me just, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe this is a particularly uh, NDP criticism, but it also just smells a bit like a deathbed conversion on some of this stuff. Like the school meal program, don't get me wrong, I'm all in for it. It is excellent policy. I don't think you're going to find anybody who will argue with the content of it as a policy. But it's also something that has been a liberal commitment for, you know, depending on who you ask since 2019 or 2020, like, they, you know, they could have pulled this off the shelf at any time. And so to suddenly sort of view the urgency of it now, I like, I don't know, you know, well, I'm not sure that it really impacts people beyond this weekend. And I think, I think we're actually seeing a strategy that was really focused around how to counter program against April 1st. Um, and I don't know that we'll see a whole lot of it continue past budget day. Just to, to kind of double down on, on some of that, like, you know, we've talked about this before about the narrow casting of some of these initiatives and, and, you know, we're, I'm not going to talk about the policy of it, but just the politics of it. They're too narrow a band of voters. Like, uh, you know, you can say whatever you want on a policy basis about a school lunch program, but you're talking about a small subset of a small subset of a small subset of families affected by that. Whereas the carbon tax, tax touches every single life, like it touches everyone in the country. And, you know, uh, you, there's been a lot of kudos given to, to Fraser on housing issues, but the focus is overwhelmingly being on renters and, and income tested, you know, rental properties, low income housing. Uh, uh, that is not how, I, in my view, how you reach out to millennials. All the research I've shown is, is they are renting and they don't want to be. Uh, so the rental stuff is, is, you know, just another sign that you don't get me, bro. And the, you know, and on the means, means tested of a portion of this, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't feel they'll ever qualify for that. So it's like you have a housing strategy that leaves out the people who are most affected and most likely to cast a ballot on the issue, which is why I think, you know, uh, Polyev is continuing to trounce them on that issue. It's, it's the wrong solution from a political standpoint, in my view, because it's it's narrow cast to a group of people who who are, um, you know, uh, marginal voters at the best of times and and not uh, significant enough in, in terms of the size of the electorate to to really bend the curve in the way they need to. You know, this conversation. <clears throat> can I just pick up, Scott, and then just a ask you this twist on it, which is I agree with Corey. Like, I'm, I'm happy about the program, but if it was going to be an affordability measure, it should have been universal so that they could say everybody no longer pays for fucking lunch. Um, and you know that you're no longer going to have to pay to, 
make your kids lunch and that is going to help your grocery bill that's going to make a difference also but can no, i just say if you were to campaign on no parent ever needing to pack their children's lunch again you would win by a landslide <laughs> like just <laughs> right right but, but you wouldn't because there aren't enough parents right like, <laughs> like, this is the issue <laughs> so they so that would work in that context but not only does it is it not universal they're not going to even be able to tell anybody what kind of person gets it like you just can't imagine yourself in the program so that's the political problem of it and i wonder whether there's a political there's a mismatch here between the government's political strategy which appears to be we're not shaving off our rough edges and tacking toward poly f to try to make the diff, just to try to close that gap we're going to wheel with a completely alternative vision of government and affordability and take it to them. So there was a longish piece in the Hill Times the other day about the country's supply chains. For those of you who have been underground spelunking for the past four years, supply chains are the end-to-end -end links joining growers, miners, manufacturers, shippers, wholesalers, retailers, warehousers, and transporters to customers. Supply chains keep shelves stocked and life running normally. During the pandemic, they were a bit of a disaster. Russia's invasion of Ukraine made things worse. It seemed like the system's lug nuts were stripping and gaskets were blowing everywhere. Anyway, our supply chains are working better now. You may have noticed new cars are back in showrooms. Stuff you order online is arriving more punctually. Building materials are returning to normal price levels. The federal government has actually pitched in, creating a national supply chain office to help coordinate all the different players involved in delivering goods to Canadians. But as the CEO of Supply Chain Canada pointed out in the Hill Times piece, problems remain. Canada lags in areas like automation, and all players on the supply chain must collaborate more than they do. Our sponsor, CN, is one of those players, were it not for its punctual performance, our supply chains would collapse. CN believes transparent data sharing is key. It already shares more data with the public than any other railway and has repeatedly urged other supply chain participants to follow suit. This is serious stuff, people. We need to ensure the breakdowns and disruptions of recent years don't recur. The new government office should require full cooperation from every link in the chain. It's a matter of the common good. Is there a mismatch between the government's political strategy and the Department of Finance's fiscal strategy? Yeah, of course there is. That's exactly what I was going to say in reply. I mean, the challenge is that you can't make these programs universal and because you can't afford it. So they're nine years into government and they're operating under a heavy set of constraints. And so they're saying... I can't make these things universal so that they actually work for me politically. I can't advertise them so that with with partisan money, because I don't have it, or if you had to believe some people, they don't think it's wise now. Um, and I can't advertise using government money because I passed a piece of legislation basically tying me to a fucking chair that's been hurtled toward losing an election. So um, so they have to operate within these constraints. And there, therefore, it's give me the best possible earned media strategy with this combination of policies that allow me to try to tell some kind of story to either compete with the carbon tax or to get agency on their own. But, you know, and so... Their answer to Corey is, Corey, you're wrong, right? Their, their answer to Corey, because of Quite the constraints, possible. I would argue, <laughs> is, um, is it, 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 that, no, you're wrong. It's not as small a wedge of voters as you think because it's got the mums and grandmums paying attention as well. And so it's a much bigger voter pool than you give it credit for. Um, and, and they would dispute uh, that it's because, you know, they can't make it universal. And I think... So I think, so it is what it like, is. They're operating like, with these constraints. Okay, and, but here's but the thing. One, wait, wait, hang on. Before Jordan right. starts, I want to say one more thing about Jordan. But Jordan's intervention, I think, highlights another political challenge that's emerging. And this may be a good thing or a bad thing for the government. But th this strategy is pissing off NDPers, right? Because it is getting a bit of news hole. And people in politics pay attention to the news hole the way, unfortunately, people who just vote don't. was funny yesterday, to be honest. 
Yeah. And so you can see them kind of going, well, this is directionally correct, but it's too limited in its ambition. And, 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 and it was and our fucking can, idea anyway. And it's our <laughs> idea. And he's right about that. And, and so you can feel that, that, that strain and, you know, yet he's going to vote for the budget, right? So that you end up in this world where you can feel, you're starting to feel the tensions between the NDP and the liberals really starting to, um, really starting to surface because as they try to pursue that strategy with the constraints that you're talking about, David, of sort of giving an alternative thesis to Polyev, uh, albeit one that may not get heard by any voters, the who is hearing it is that they're NDP partners in the CNS agreement and they're fucking pissed about it. So it's funny to watch all that unfold. I just don't <laughs> well, know if it changes a darn thing is the problem. Yeah, I mean, I guess to that, I was going to say, I think that sometimes with these things, like you also run the risk, for example, if you are that hypothetical voter that would be swayed by these announcements, like, why wouldn't you just like want the fucking real thing with the NDP, right? Like, do you, you know, if you are voting on things like school lunch programs, on deeply expanding childcare, on real help for renters, like if those are your issue sets, then I think there's going to be a strong pull for you to look at the NDP and not not necessarily to it to invest in the liberals again, 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 <laughs> um, as the vehicle for that. Well, you're, 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 sorry, that is bang on. That is bang on, and that is why when the when this agreement breaks up, the liberals need a fucking killer wedge with you guys. Yes. Need a killer wedge with the NDP in th that justifies that breakup because otherwise your logic is impeccable. Well, well I, I, do, I mean, I the NDP has been on the, the receiving end of it for many years and it can flip the other way around. It, it can, I, I, but Singh is still the leader. And I don't know how many people will swallow that pill. I still think somebody needs to pull the bullshit alarm uh, desperately right now because I'd like to meet the, uh, the, the parent. Uh, who's really excited about the prospect of their uh, their son or daughter living in low income housing and having to use a school lunch program, and how uh, somehow these policies are going to compel yeah, I them think, into I think, voting? Corey, I think you overstate it because <laughs> I think that while it's true that nobody is excited about the idea of living in social housing, people do believe that the federal government has a role in solving this problem. But where I think that the liberals got this announcement wrong is that it's 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 just it it doesn't meet the scale. It doesn't it doesn't like it meets no identified well, need, right? And like well, it doesn't respond even to the feeling that people have if you're a renter and you feel like you can't get ahead. It just it just kind of reinforces the insult. I think the problem though for millennial voters is they can't afford to buy a house and uh, and saying you're going to build more rental housing or subsidize rental housing for the lowest income people. Uh, is not uh, is just tone deaf. It's 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 a problem that they're not talking about. Like they're talking about more supply generally and bringing housing prices down and uh, having interest rates come down so they can afford to have a mortgage. And that I think you're directionally right, but so, sometimes you've seen. I would just say in your articulation of this point, which gets made often, I do think sometimes you're a little dismissive. It's a little bit like every like you like chicks. In high heels and nylons, everybody must like chicks with high heels and nylons. That's got to be everyone's fetish. Not everyone's fetish is a McMansion necessarily. You know, I, I'm going to well, say that. I'm going to say that when it comes to school food, I have pulled on this. I've worked on this file. I'll do give a, a conflict thing. I've worked with the uh, Maple Leaf Center for Action on Food Insecurity, and um, and so I've pulled on this subject, and I know that it's going to be very, very well. The concept. Sorry, this is it. I'm going to sound like an economist on the carbon tax. <laughs> the concept of a national food program is very popular. Whether this program is very popular is a different matter. But well, I understand a, the temptation, right? Like, I think it's good. Like, you go out and and the the obvious thing is is from the liberals' perspective, it's okay. Let the conservatives argue that we shouldn't feed children, right? So I I, I think that on that level. You know, it's it, it's fine. But I think that whether it's going to actually move people or whether there's there's that sense of credibility behind it for voters who are genuinely motivated on this issue, I really question that. Well, yeah. you know, it, it has to be there has to be some intersection with the practical reality of people's lives, I think, for any policy measure to really move votes. Like, you know, it's it's 
there are things that can that are motherhood and apple pie. Who's going to be campaigning against uh, you know meals for for kids at schools who can't afford to have one? Nobody. That's well, who's going to be also fighting voted against Nobody. the proposal already. So <laughs> right. I mean, there is a case voted, being built there because he voted against the budget. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. but by, okay, well, that's fair you know, game. Good, good, good. No, luck apparently with that. there was apparently there was a private members bill yeah, specifically on order, this so. that he voted. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, great, great. It's the end of time. It's the end of times now, Corey. It's. I don't think this is. I trumped uh, you with that private be... members' bill argument. That always wins <laughs> ele- elections. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's almost as, <laughs> almost as good as not withstanding. But you know, being rolled out in a debate, I mean, listen, right? uh, many, oh, many, oh, many oh, private whoa. members. <laughs> many private some members some bill honorable bill. members. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, where everybody would like to get rid of the notwithstanding clause. Mm. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just, I, I just spare. Spare a tear or a shed of concern for the people stuck in a in a goddamn dingy 1988 decorated boardroom in Langevin who are nevertheless demanded of to produce some kind of communication strategy that creates these fault lines, that generates earned media, but that doesn't spend substantial amounts of money and doesn't require advertising support. I mean, like wh- I, at some point, like you got to have some human kindness society that feels bad for those people. What the fuck are they supposed to come up with? It, it sounds like the script for the drones, next Let's Cruise, get drones. We'll draw movie. messages on people's heads. <laughs> With a global push to phase out fossil fuels while meeting increased electricity demand, there is a growing recognition that while we need all sources of clean electricity to meet climate targets, there is no achievable path to net zero without nuclear power. Canada was one of more than 20 countries to sign a ministerial declaration to triple nuclear energy by 2050, recognizing the nuclear industry's importance in achieving global net zero targets and keeping the goal of limiting overall worldwide temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius within reach. Today's podcast sponsor, Bruce Power, one of the world's largest nuclear generating facilities located in Tiverton, Ontario, is uniquely positioned to help Canada achieve its economic and climate change objectives between now and 2050. In coordination with the ministerial pledge, they joined 119 other nuclear industry signatories active in 140 countries worldwide in signing a net zero nuclear industry pledge to help achieve this lofty goal. This pledge is part of Bruce Power's ongoing commitment to support future clean energy targets by renewing its fleet through its life extension program and major component replacement projects and investing in increasing net peak output from its existing assets, because there's no net zero without nuclear. We'll we'll we'll, ch- we'll check in with the with the liberal offensive next week and see see how it's doing. Let's move on to our next topic, um, which is from the Vancouver Sun. Douglas Todd writing about Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives in BC, and he says it wasn't a scenario normally associated with Conservative Party leader Pierre Polyev. Encircled by dozens of First Nations leaders, Polyev was the focus of attention and respect at a ritual-filled gathering this year at the Vancouver Convention Centre. The event, one of dozens Polyev has held in BC in recent months, drew little media attention, but it was significant for the chiefs who gave Polyev symbolic gifts. It was their joint announcement of a First Nations proposal to directly collect taxes from industry. The good vibes among the group of First Nations leaders resonated with more far-reaching polls, which show the Conservatives far ahead of the Liberals across the country, and especially in B.C. In the next election, they're poised to reduce the Liberals to a few ridings from their current 15 in B.C. A March abacus poll showed Polyev's party at a whopping, is a whopping 27 percentage points ahead of the Liberals in B.C. and 22 percentage points ahead of the NDP. Analysts at 338Canada.com, who amalgamate publicly available Canadian polls, projected this month the Conservatives would win 27 of BC's 42 seats. That would be a gain of 14. The party is also in four more toss-up BC races. Meanwhile, the Liberals, who are clinging to a minority government because they have support from the NDP, would hold on to only three BC seats, two in North Surrey and one in South Vancouver. That's a drop of 11 ridings. 
the NDP is predicted to maintain six seats and lose seven. Wow. There. Just watching Jordan's face for a minute. <laughs> and Corey, can you explain to us what's going on, BC? Well, I think we've been talking about what a lot of those things are. I think carbon tax is 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 driving the numbers there. And uh, I think we're going to be chatting a little bit about provincial races too. And I, I think it's playing out there also. But, uh, you know, I think the fundamental problem is you've got too many parties swimming in the same pool of voters and that pool of voters is too small to, to support one party, let alone three. Uh, and there's, they're seating, you know, 60, 65% of the electorate on certain issues like carbon tax to the conservatives to hold on their own. Uh, you know, there's, there are not enough people in favor of some of these banner projects or policies for the, the liberal party, uh, to support them doing well. And, um, you know, it's, I, I, I think at a fundamental level, it's that simple. I think the stuff, uh, with outreach to, uh, first nations, uh, in BC is, 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 uh, very astute. And, uh, I think, uh, probably good policy in terms of, uh, trying to uh, get more First Nations buy into resource development projects and other projects. I think they're a critical part of the economy in lots of the country, but particularly in the North, particularly in Western Canada, and particularly in British Columbia. So, you know, trying to find a way to uh, create better partnerships there is 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 something that Conservatives have struggled with historically and, and isn't going to happen without, you know, a very uh, determined and uh, uh, prolonged effort, uh, which is what I think you're seeing. So, uh, and I think there are political rewards for that too. So, I, you know, but I, I don't think the drivers are are hugely different in British Columbia than they are in Ontario, than they are in in, in Atlantic Canada in terms of cro carbon tax crowding out most other issues right now. One of dozens of meetings he's had, of events he's had in BC in recent months. He's out there a lot, eh? Well, you can say there's no path to victory without Quebec for the Liberals, and that's true. But I, I think it's equally true there's no path to victory for them with the British Columbia. Well, Scott, you know, I was fucking proud of what we were able to accomplish in British Columbia when Paul was the leader. We won uh, among the highest seat in the election. We lost. We won one of the highest seat totals Liberal Party's ever had at to that point um, in B.C. But... When Trudeau became leader, he supercharged the Liberal Party in B.C. He took it to a different level. He had a real personal following in in B.C. He was personally very popular. And he was seen as somebody with some connection to the place, reinforced by ads in 2015 that showed him running the Grouse Mountain and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, he has made B.C. an essential part of the Liberal winning coalition and he's made the liberal party over the course of the last decade a very serious federal political party which it was not really outside of a few seats in bc before that so this is quite tragic if this is going to happen that we get yeah. wiped out to Sur wiped down to surrey yeah I, I agree and i do think it's an unremarked upon accomplishment of his uh, political time in office that he's made the Liberal Party, not just competitive, but a winner in BC in multiple elections, and that's that's something that um, that's something that defied so many others. Uh, but and yes, he had a personal connection, and that got marketed, and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, we're telling the same tale here, right? It's you've got the wind at your back. You're on the right side of time for a change. You appear to be the downbound train that's gathering speed and people are congregating around you and people are making calculations about whether they want to be with you and not be with you. And so, I mean, I don't know. I don't have a lot of insight other than it's a good time to be Pierre Polyev. Like when you're in that situation, when you're on the right side of time for a change, like piss turns to scotch and shit turns to chocolate and everything just breaks your way, man. And you know, that's, you know, I mean, I know there's a chorus in the background. Of the blue question. Going, it's peaking too early. He's peaking too early. It's too much scotch. It's going to turn back to piss, but, you know, we'll see. Let me ask you a straight up question. If Aaron O'Toole had been allowed to remain on as leader of the party and was the leader of the Conservative Party today, are they in better shape or worse shape than they are right now? Or are they the same? Is it the same? Are you asking me? Anybody. Uh, 
worse. They're worse because I think the the sharp contrast on carbon tax uh, is uh, what is is the wedge that's being used to drive a message on on affordability issues uh, that's resonating with people. And uh, and we'll talk about this in my hey you a little bit. But uh, there were a lot of conservative. Uh, policy wonks, economists, and uh, so-called clever people who are good at everything except winning elections, who uh, uh, you know, uh, had advocated to uh, support a carbon tax. And this is the, you know, this is the famed uh, solar-powered blender that uh, our friend Jenny talked about a lot uh, back uh, in, in the O2 election campaign. So I, I, I think, so you know, I, clever I, blender people. Yeah. So like, I, look, I, I, I don't think uh, they would be doing better. And I, I think it's because because of the clarity of that that messaging, the clarity of that wedge. And I think just the, the obvious political math that, you know, when you have like a 50 50 issue, which, you know, when you minus out the people who don't care is basically what carbon tax has been over time. You want to be the party in with 100 percent of the 50 percent. You don't want to be one of three other parties dividing up the 50 percent. There is no future in that from a political standpoint. And uh, you've got to establish those wedge issues and you've got to make sure you're on the right side of enough of them. Uh, to create a, a, a you know frame where you can win, and I think that's what what Polyev has done, and and so yeah, I don't I don't see things being better uh, uh, on the other side. Anyway, Jordan, we are going to we're going to get into this more in the provincial thing, but these are terrible numbers for the NDP too. I mean, Scott and I have been uh, moaning about the uh, sad numbers for the Liberals, but I mean, for the NDP to lose half their seats in BC, um, it's a bad day, and and yeah, according no bueno. to According to the model, uh, sings on the bubble. Yeah, well, I mean, it, yeah, his writing. Not that that matters. He's not going to be the leader after the next election anyway. So. Well, I mean, his writing has got yeah, he's got some potential splits there for sure. But look, I think you know, I don't, yeah, I don't like these numbers at all. Um, I think it's good that we're a ways off from an election. <laughs> That's important. Uh, and I think you know, if any way to I, stop that election. Yeah. <laughs> We, we just we got to work on that time machine we were recommending for the liberals earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, look, obviously it's a it's a change election, and so this this makes uh, this makes Polyev's crisp brand of change uh, all the more likely to garner support momentum at this point. But I mean, to the to the point that the the article made, I I, I don't want to overstate. I think where Metro Vancouver is necessarily going to go on this. I think that the change that Polyev is offering is, is not in alignment with the values of a lot of folks in BC. I think that it's tough to imagine uh, the Conservatives sweeping all areas of BC without some sort of a credible climate plan, um, particularly uh, presumably in the wake of the kind of forest fire season that we're likely to see. I mean, when you have got like families that are now living with like a fucking suitcase packed by the door because it is an annual thing that you flee your home, you you don't you don't get to kind of opt out of answering that question for the entire duration of a campaign. So I, I do think that this is probably the one place in the country where he he could potentially pay a price for uh, for his climate plan, which at this point we can really only assume includes either some very heavy regulation to make up for the lack of a consumer carbon price or lowered ambition, right? And so I think he'll be pressed on that, uh, hopefully, by someone. <laughs> um, but, you know, as for as for the change vote, I, I mean, the end, there's no question, the NDP is much better positioned than the Liberals in BC. You know, Angus Reid was out yesterday, they're up eight points over the Liberals. They are ride. They they can also ride Eby's coattails. Who, though I know uh, Corey is keen to to talk down, like Eby's still relatively quite popular in BC, and will lift the federal numbers as well. So, I think you know if I'm if I'm a New Democrat in BC, I'm I don't like these numbers, but I'm I'm doubling down on on winning that progressive primary there, capitalizing on what comes out of the BC election, and uh, and hopefully trying to hold the conservatives to account in some of those blue orange races um, because certainly that conversation is not really happening national nationally at this point. No, David, I, I know yeah. that I know we don't have unlimited time because, you know, it's the internet and uh, there's so much space, but the, 
I think an interesting what if, maybe for some point when we're all drunk and we come on camera and talk, is not so much what if the conservatives had kept uh, O'Toole, but what if what if Trudeau had not proceeded with the carbon tax? What if he had said, as we started to get into the earliest stages, for example, of the of the cost of living challenge? What if he'd said, "We're gonna, we're just gonna." We're going to pause this thing uh, for three, four years until, you know, we're firmly back into uh, 1.5% inflation per annum or something like that. Like, what if, you know, I think that's an interesting what if, because it, Corey attributed so much uh, to that. It begs the question of, well, would there just be, you no, know, he's too long in the tooth. He's been there for, without the, with, with, without the literally the spark of the carbon tax, where would the liberals be? And the carbon tax is the accelerant. Mm. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, there's no way of knowing, and it's kind of jerking off. But it's, yeah. um, it's, become, it's, an it's become the symbol. It's become the symbol. But you know, the, the bigger what if question is, uh, you know, what do you think the polling numbers are going to look like when a year from now, next April first, when when the carbon tax goes up yet again? Will the electorate be like, oh well, things are getting better, the economy is better, I'm now happy to pay this? Or they'll be, you guys don't get it, and they're going to bludgeon them even more. School breakfast uh, program, <clears throat> right? Exactly. I think it's more of a question for Tim Hackler <laughs> than anyone else. The, the, the other question that I, I always keep coming back to: How many times can a leader half a party's uh, cut a, a number of a party's seats in half? <laughs> Uh, before they get fired from their job. And apparently for Jagmeet Singh, it's at least twice. It's at least twice. Patience is a virtue card. <laughs> Providing clean energy for future generations will require innovative new technologies to ensure Canadians have access to affordable and reliable electricity. Nuclear energy is a significant part of this solution. Canada, a pioneer in developing safe, dependable nuclear energy, owes much to McMaster University scientists in Hamilton, home to one of the largest research reactors in North America. Researchers at McMaster are using their nuclear expertise to advance new technologies such as small modular reactors, which offer the potential to provide accessible, safe, and low-cost energy to communities across the country. They've launched a program to provide training to graduate students on reactor operations and nuclear safety, preparing the next generation of Canadians for the high-skilled jobs of a nuclear future. Investing in research can support the energy transition and reskill our workforce. That's why U15 Canada is a proud member of the Coalition for Canadian Research. The Coalition is urging the federal government to support science and talented Canadian researchers with new funding this budget. We have to support Canadian ambition, full stop. Visit researchcoalition.ca to learn more. Scott, I'm just going to say one last thing to you, which is if I was Trudeau, nothing would make me say you've got to be fucking kidding more than indigenous leaders and chiefs meeting with Polyev and starting to say, well, this guy looks interesting to me. Maybe this could, I mean, Trudeau has spent so much political capital on this issue over the last eight years to the point where he's alienated so many non-Indigenous Canadians with the talk and the this and the that and the money. And, you know, the money's so enormous. Like I said to somebody last week, if you don't think that Poiliev would have found a way not to give Cindy Blackstock $40 billion, you're crazy. He would have. And so, it to me, yeah. like this is like, oh my God. Th that's when you know that the wheels are right off the goddamn thing. When people who have no business being anywhere but in your camp are shopping. Well, this is going to come as a real splash of cold water to everyone on this panel <laughs> and everyone listening. But politics is a cruel motherfucker. <laughs> It's the way she yeah. goes. I mean, we, in 2006, we watched all those child care advocates sit on their hands and stitch their mouths shut. Or yeah. the teachers union running ads against Kathleen Wynne. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. I always say to I mean, those people, do you know who they're running against? Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Last topic. Three provincial elections coming up in the fall. So we're about six months away. From them, um, let's since we've been talking BC, let's stay with BC and let's start out in BC. It looks really difficult to predict. First of all, the polls are 
not clear on whether there's a battle going on between BC United and the Provincial Conservative Party or whether that battle has been lost already by BC United and won by the BC Conservative Party. Some polls say one thing, other polls say another thing. Um, They all... um, Everybody seems to think that the provincial conservatives are riding Polyev's coattails and riding the carbon tax coattails. EB is in front in all the polls, but you always know that if a BC election polarizes, a polarized BC election is a close election in almost all scenarios, right? So let's start with you, Jordan. Do you think EB is safe? Well, I mean, I will never say that because I remember the Adrian Dix campaign, the this man could kick a dog and uh, it's a headline. So I will never curse a campaign that way. So I wouldn't say that he's safe. I think he's in a solid position. I think I think he's doing a lot of the right things. Um, you know, the health care and affordability remain really the top concerns for let's just call them left of center voters and his vote coalition is made up of federal New Democrats and a lot of federal liberals. So he has a wide, he's got a pretty wide pool of voters to draw from there. And for those voters, there really doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite for change. They, uh, even if they're not like super enthusiastic about how the government is handling all aspects of those things, they like how EB is handling it more than what the other parties are offering. And they aren't, they aren't like really frothing for change. So I think in that sense, He's he's well positioned. What he like his announcements and and I would say I think they've done a really good job on the housing file. Like they've been very aggressive and really um, repetitive on it. And I think that that's shielding him a little bit on some of the affordability stuff. It's so interesting what's happening on the right side of the ledger. So you know BC United is really like you can see them being squeezed on both sides, right? So you've got obviously the BC Conservatives riding on Polyev's coattails and and eating up a lot of their support um, on the center right. And and whereas historically you might see some liberals going going towards them. I, I mean Falcon is not is not well liked. Like he's, you know, they just launched a multi-million dollar ad. Is campaign. that how you say it? Have I been saying it wrong oh, my whole life? Sorry, no, Falcon. I, like Falcon. the bird. Yeah. Like right. the bird. I, I, I have the same affliction, Jordan. I've said that <laughs> many times as well. So. <laughs> It sounds more glamorous. I, I know. It's actually maybe it would work better for Tony him. Tony Oanzolini. But anyway, it's not working. Like his, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but like his net favorability with women is at negative 35. Like it's just brutal, right? So he's. Grace, that's mean. Of, that's that's, that's my high school number. women from Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had that beat. I had that beat. Yes. And how did it work out for you guys? So. Look, but like problem for him, he he's not getting out of high school in this campaign, right? So, so he is really like they are just uh, they are just being squeezed from both sides. And then as for the BC Conservatives, I mean, obviously, like they're just they're riding like the most incredible ride you could just ever imagine um, for a party that hasn't run a full slate since what like 1960. <laughs> um, so they they've got uh, for sure. They're, you know, to be running neck and neck with BC United is, I think, pretty incredible for them right now. But, you know, their fundraising numbers are still really lagging. Like they, in the last quarter, they raised less than the Greens. So the machinery clearly hasn't hasn't really caught up with where they're at. And I don't know that they have time to squeeze BC United out in, in a primary on the right. But it's going to be a fascinating race to watch for sure. Corey, um, Fel- I have to assume that most British Columbians do not know who John Rustad is um, and certainly don't aren't very familiar with what he'd be like. So it feels to me right now like EB's running against Paul E. F. Yeah, I think there's an element of that. Um, I, I, I think what's going on is, is a inversion of what you're seeing in Ottawa right now uh, with, uh, with BC United looking like a you know, uh, enabler and and far too close on the Venn diagram, too much overlap with with EB, uh, on, especially on some key issues like carbon tax. I, I, there's not enough di- differentiation there to pull off uh, being the alternative to government for people who are unhappy with with where things are going and how. But he was going. supposed to be the right winger, but like he ran against Clark, and that was the argument back no, then. She's but, a fucking liberal. I'm a conservative. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, but you know, th- th- those are words. You gotta, you gotta, you know, bear that out with some of the issues that you're putting in the window and some of the things that you're talking about. And I, I, I think it's less um, riding uh, the coattails of polio for the BC conservatives and more riding the same issue set. And having much clearer uh, fault lines and, and delineation between the parties, uh, it's much easier to market something that's different than uh, than just a, a, a subtle, subtly different shade of the same color. Like it's 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 pretty hard to do that. I think the candidates and and the money tend to follow momentum, especially in provincial politics, and I would say especially in BC politics, which has you know reversed and thrown out parties and you know had them obliterated and a new party come up like this is a routine part of of the history of bc politics in the same way it is in quebec so i i I would never bet against the chances of a big surprise especially when you look at the underlying numbers on you know right track wrong direction you know overall happiness with with the provincial government there's a lot of things that would be keeping me up at night in those numbers if i were premier eby uh, you know, it's not like there's strong fundamentals underneath the, the support that they have in the polls right now. I think there's there are warning signs and red flags. And, uh, you know, if if the B.C. conservatives can kind of keep their shit together long enough, uh, I think there's potential for an upset. But uh, that's predicated on a bunch of things that, uh, you know, have to come together. But, you know, they'll have I think weird it's candidates. Be, it's oh, they already did. Sure. They- well, ready to yeah. turf the, we're, we're, the anti-vaccine doctor we're, and like we're, just well, or, or do they right An like, dream. Remember, remember remember the socrates there were a lot of weird weird folks in that uh, in that government over the years uh and a lot more tolerance starting with the weirdness. ones running it right yeah i was gonna say uh, i don't know if that's the bar that we want to like my, encourage. my point being my point being that uh in, in british columbia you know uh it hasn't been the impediment that it has been in, in perhaps in Ontario or other places. Right. right. Now, if you can elect Bill Vanderzam, the premier, who qualifies as a bad, can- as a weird candidate? Scott, you got any thoughts on BC? Oh, I kind of echo some stuff just said. I, I mean, BC has never been shy about making a big swing. And it is capable of electing really left governments. And it's capable of electing really right governments. And I would be nervous if I were ZB. I actually, I'll go this far as to say that I think right now, the way this thing's rolling, uh, BC United is obviously just like, they're going straight into Georgia straight. Like they're just, they're, they're, I, I think this thing looks like it could be melting to nothing. And so I think this election is going to come down to the BC conservatives. I think ultimately they're going to have people who say crazy things and it's like, and fuck crazy things and believe crazy things and all of that is going to come out and it's going to be put on trial and their ability to the manage great themselves candidate in a maelstrom. Story there, I am sure. What's that? <laughs> I'm sure you have a great candidate search story that inspired that comment. <laughs> maybe, maybe more than one. And uh, so I think they're going to find themselves in this maelstrom. I think they're going to find themselves with wind at their back and they're going to be rising in the polls and Evie's going to be scared. And I don't think it's going to come down to Evie. I think it's going to come down to the conservatives and whether or not they can manage the inevitable test of can you manage your crazies? Can you handle your crazies? Can you look like you're professional enough in a short window to get through to the finish line? I, I actually, there are ingredients for that kind of race. And um, and it may come down uh, to advertising on the part of EB in the last six days of the campaign that says, these people are just like that too much crazy. And then BC will tell us whether it's willing to buck or accept that trend. I don't see any evidence that the climate that sorry that the carbon tax issue is playing any differently in BC than it is anywhere else, uh, despite the fact that they have their own tax and they had it for a long time. And I mean, it, well, it's one it, very direct well, impact is that it's blowing up Falcon. Right? It's yes. a, it's yeah. a monster in a bit in a, in addition to his lack of charisma, it's a barrier to him being taken credibly as totally. a center right leader right now. And yeah. I actually think it's interesting because you do have this this EB Polyev fight that's really been been set up and I think EB's EB's been playing that in a really interesting way. Like he's not he's not buying Polyev's frame, like he's definitely sparring back with Polyev. 
But the BC NDP is not like they're not wedded to the carbon tax. Like these are the guys that ran the OG axe the tax campaign in 2009, right? So they have a little bit more ideological flexibility around the tools on on tackling carbon pricing than I think many other provincial sections of the NDP do. And so I would be surprised to see them entirely cornered on that issue. I think they'll go where they need to go on that. And um, and I think that actually that fight uh, may not end up being as fruitful against EB as uh, as some are hoping. Excellent. Well, he would have to he would have to back away from it. I don't see any signs of that. We'll see. It's tax season, and even politicos can agree doing your taxes isn't that fun. But according to a 2020 study, more than two million Canadians miss out on the rebates and credits they're eligible for because they don't file a tax return leaving $1.7 billion on the table. There are many reasons that could prevent someone from filing. Cost shouldn't be one of them. If you've been listening for the last few weeks, you know what's coming. Wealth Simple has a simple solution. You may be waiting until the 11th hour, but millions of Canadians have already submitted. Nearly one in five net filers submitted using Wealth Simple. One in five. For good reason. Wealth Simple makes filing easy, accurate, and affordable. In fact, you can file for as little as zero dollars. That's right, zero, no cost. But you'd be surprised how many people pay even when they don't have to. Why do people voluntarily pay for something they could get for free? Because they're happy. Imagine a happy person who just did their taxes. It's another example of how Wealth Simple is changing the game. So don't forget. Do your taxes and stay tuned for more from Wealth Simple. You know what? We're at an hour. And just out of consideration for our listeners, I'm going to call it a day. <laughs> Let's leave Saskatchewan and New Brunswick to next week. We'll come back to them. There were, at least Saskatchewan is sadly a relatively short conversation. Um, and uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's pull this thing together with Gordon Pinson asking for our hey use. Ladies and gentlemen, Please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. All right. Who wants to start? Well, I could go because it builds on my last comment around carbon tax. So my hey you is going out to the federal liberals this week. Just so much free advice for you guys. Like, I'm sure you love to hear it. Um, and my hey you is around, uh, around Premier Canoe and the carbon tax. So... This man is throwing you a lifeline right now. He is taking you at your word. He is going to present his own plan to get Manitoba off the backstop, presumably that will meet an acceptable level of ambition in terms of climate change. You should be hugging him. The response from the PMO should not be awkward, frosty silence. This is actually what you, what you would want to see out of Prairie Premiers. And so for the life of me, I don't understand why you're not pouring a little bit of enthusiasm into that relationship right now, because this is the absolute best outcome that you could hope for, for a Prairie Premier on this issue right at this exact moment. So that is my hey you this week. Why do you meet with them? How often do Premiers meet with uh, federal opposition leaders? Yeah, I think, I think it was smart to meet with them. Like, you can't look scared of it, Right. And for sure, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of. Well, it was a huge win for Polyev. That meeting it was a massive win for Polyev. Yeah, I don't think it was bad for Canoe. I think that there's overlap for sure between their voters, mm. and you need to be able to say that you've had you know you've had some dialogue. This issue is playing out in a big way in Manitoba, and Canoe had to get his arms around it. And I think he did that really effectively this week. I think I think he took up a space that has been until now unoccupied. I think it's such a stark contrast to what you see out of Mo in Saskatchewan. Uh, I think it plays very well for him. He looks constructive. And uh, and he's in control. He's in control of that message. He did very well, I think. Yeah. Corey, hey, you. Uh, I'm going to throw mine to uh, Sean Spear, who, uh, <laughs> uh, for those who don't know me, he's a former conservative staffer. And uh, I think they have a, uh, a podcast, uh, kind of like this one, only without any advertisers uh, and much smaller <laughs> audience. But, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you, I'd Corey. Like I appreciate say, that. 
Yes. Uh, look, uh, the thesis that uh, he was putting out uh, going into the weekend is the Ford government are not conservatives, et cetera, et cetera. I would just uh, like to say, look, uh, you know, opinions uh, will vary on all of these things. But uh, what remains constant is that there are a lot of people who are in the pointy head part of the party uh, around these kinds of things. So if you listen to their political advice, uh, Polyev would be campaigning for a carbon tax, not against it, because a lot of those same people were the architects of, uh, <laughs> of that particular policy uh, disaster, which is defining you know, not just Canadian politics, but you know the driving uh, Polyev's lead currently in the poll. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there's some version of stolen valor here where you have people who are in the more the intellectual side of political parties uh, who have bold ideas and bold plans uh, as to what you should do on the policy front that uh, are absolutely incompatible with getting elected in the first place and implementing anything. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, opinion noted, um, you know, maybe maybe find some people who've had some success running campaigns or winning government, and uh, you'll be more com compelling in your arguments. Kishu. <laughs> and then again. <laughs> I enjoyed that. All right, Scott. Um, well, degree to which that was about, uh, about the integrity of the participants in a political party. Because um, I think what Corey's really acknowledging is that he has no integrity and he'll do anything. <laughs> he's not a real conservative. He's not dedicated to the cause in an ideological standpoint. But in any event, I'll let that go. That's his fight. Um, I, my hey, you, uh, Kind of a thin-skinned babyish. The last couple of weeks, I've been getting a lot of blowback, so I'm 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 gonna re-blow. I'm doing the blow blowback, uh, the blowback back, and blow here's back what's better. been happening. Huh? Blow back better. Blow back better. Blow back better. Blow back better. Blow back bitter. Mm. However you want to characterize it, mm. but I'm here's the thing that I'm getting. As we sit here and talk, and sometimes on some other platforms, TV and radio shows, I chat about the liberals, the struggles with the carbon tax, struggles with where they're at, um, you know, the inability to advertise. Uh, I'm getting, I'm starting to get an increasing number of hacks, emails, and online comments. Uh, are you even a liberal anymore? Why don't you like stand up? You're supposed to be the liberal in this forum. Like, get on there and fight the fight and back up our prime minister and you know and yada yada yada. And I'm just going to tell you right now. Here's been my approach to this for a long time, and whether people like it or not, I am absolutely a liberal. I am a dedicated partisan liberal. I give money every year. I commit energy to the party. I volunteer, and I will vote liberal always, pretty much always. I'm only but I'm going to give an honest opinion when I'm asked. And it's not because I think I'm so goddamn smart and people need to hear my honest opinion, but I'm not going to give an opinion that is just, oh, well, that's what the partisan, the best partisan performance can be. I'm just going to give a take. And sometimes that take is going to piss off my fellow liberals. And I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it's going to be. And don't send me notes saying, don't you feel any loyalty to the party? Don't you think you need to like weigh in harder? No, right? My my loyalty is beyond question. Kiss my ass. I've been in this party for over 30 years. And if I'm asked by CTV what my honest take is on something, I'm going to give an honest take unless I have some reason to lie. And that's it. That's here. here. Well, that's the show. That's what we're all trying to do. Yep. Um, there are lots of reasons to lie. But anyway, that's another topic. So my hey you is <clears throat> going to make you look really shitty. <clears throat> my hey you is to Minister Christia Freeland and to all the people that were involved in uh, the school food program. Um, it's too small to matter politically, and that's unfortunate. But it's big enough to help apparently 400,000 kids and families, and that makes a difference. It's a real problem in our society, food insecurity. It's a real problem for children. <clears throat> has obviously huge educational and health impacts, so as many people as we can help that way i'm game to help it and this is uh, something that i think is uh, overdue in this country and i'm pleased to see that we're at least sort of taking a tiptoe um toward doing it not to deny that there aren't school food programs going on all across the country by provincial governments and that's why i don't really see that this should be a complicated federal provincial thing 
because provinces are all running these programs. If somebody gives you unconditional money to extend it to more people, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. You already believe in the program. So it will help some people, and it's a good thing. And uh, I guess not everything has to be judged on its political merit. This has policy merit. So thank you. Congratulations. Well done. All right, you three. We're done for this week. I want to thank all of the accursed out there who watched or listened to the show this week. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, CN, Bruce Power, U15, and Wealth Simple. And we will be back next week with more of this exact kind of banter. So see you then. Take care. Bye.